This week on QDL, we talk about lights out manufacturing. Can your factory really run unattended? And how close are we to getting to lights out manufacturing? Find out more when we come back. Welcome back to QDL. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. So with COVID-19 limiting the number of people on factory floors, uh, one of the questions that comes to mind is, will this accelerate the adoption of automation with the end goal of lights out manufacturing? Now, lights out manufacturing is, is a term that's been around uh, for quite a while, and it simply refers to fully automated factories that require no human presence on site or very little human presence on site. You, you essentially, you fill them up with raw material, you hit the start button, you turn out the lights and you walk away, you come back the next morning, all your products built, ready to ship, and you just rinse and repeat. That's the idea. Uh, it's been a while, uh, around for a while, but it likely won't come fully to fruition in quite the way we expect. So joining us today to talk about Lights Out Manufacturing is Artem Krupanev, VP of Strategy at Augury. Hello, Artem. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks so much. Great to be here. Sure. So uh, first of all, before we get started into Lights Out Manufacturing, just tell us uh, just briefly a little bit about Augury. What does your company do? Sure. So we're a technology company, uh, rapidly growing in the manufacturing and industrial space. Um, and we have a simple but very ambitious vision, and that's to make sure we create a world where machines that matter are always reliable. And um, our technology protects production lines um, and also protects supply chains for our customers within the manufacturing space. Uh, we work with some of the largest manufacturers across CPG, pharmaceuticals, food and beverage, and so forth, and have actually, during COVID, seen quite an uptick in demand for the technologies you can imagine. Uh, those, uh, those industries are seeing a lot of demand uh, from consumers during this time. Okay, and so this show is about, uh, this episode is about lights out manufacturing. So in your opinion, what is the current state of lights out manufacturing? Uh, is it being widely uh, adopted or are people leaning in that direction? Have they kind of just given up on the whole idea because the technology isn't there? Where are we at? Well, I think we'll need to break that down a little bit more. Uh, but just as a, as a concept, lights out manufacturing has seen a number of different cycles over the years and it kind of ebbs and flows. Some companies taking it a bit too far uh, that idea of automating every bit of the factory and having to revert back to you know bring pe people back into the process. A good example of that is Tesla that has uh, overinvested in automation at, at least in, in one of its factories and had to roll that back quite painfully. Um, um, and I think that right now, as we, we're looking at COVID, um, it's a very unique situation. Uh, for a number of different concepts in manufacturing, including light, lights out. Um, you know, for the first time, probably in history, uh, we've seen supply chains, demand, and the workforce affected at the same time. And um, that has exposed the need for a kind of strategic resilience and anti-fragility in supply chains. And what we're talking today about for, you know, a number of, um, uh, I would say, geopolitical economic levels uh, is reshoring or the necessity to bring back manufacturing because some of those supply chains have been overextended and have become very fragile. And when the global pandemic happened, um, that exposed that fragility. Um, and what we're seeing with our customers, with our partners in the industry, um, is that ex um, innovation has been tremendously accelerated in order to be able to both protect the existing manufacturing capabilities and not just make them more efficient and also looking forward into the future in order to be able to bring back some of that manufacturing capability um, into, into kind of the nation state, the country itself, right? Whether it's in, in the Western world or other parts of the world. Um, and another thing that we're seeing is that, you know, alongside innovation, we're, we're seeing a fast tracking of those roadmaps for innovation um, and it's not just about automation. 
right? So, so it's not just about making sure that specific tasks are automated, automated better and made more efficient. We're seeing the adoption of technologies um, that otherwise would take years to adopt in order to make the whole process more agile and more resilient in itself. Um, and that's where technologies like Algorese come in and other technologies along IoT, AR, augmented reality, and so forth. Right. And I'm, I'm assuming when we're talking automation, we're not talking about just or, or lights out manufacturing. We're not, <clears throat> excuse me, not talking about just making machines do things along with all this automation. There's a lot of data being, being generated, right? So I'm assuming part of this whole thing is collecting data, uh, using that data to what refine processes, uh, that sort of thing. Well, yeah, uh, if you think about kind of for, let's say, the way I think about this, the world of, um, of manufacturing automation and digitization, there's actually two parts, right? The first part is how can we increase eff efficiency or extract value from the system? And that implies that we have a, kind of a finite amount of value that we can extract from it. And that we also have really solid assumptions around, around the process and what the outcomes of the process are. And that's the realm of automation, right? Um, we, what tasks can we automate uh, using, whether it's digital technologies or sophisticated machinery? And um, that whole concept, that whole approach of automation in a traditional sense, treats people as functions within that system. Meaning a, a, a person and the task that they perform um, is something that is designed in, right? And that could be theoretically replaced uh, by, by automation. The other side of manufacturing is, uh, I would call the realm of digitization, where people are actually treated as partners in developing and evolving the system itself. And that requires uh, a different approach to both the process, uh, it requires data, like you said, requires a number of other aspects. So you said something earlier, you said, Ideally, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it, it sounds like what you're saying, the whole idea of, of automation and lights out manufacturing is this might help bring uh, manufacturing back to uh, the United States. And I'm assuming that part of that is just because it would reduce costs. Um, I'm assuming that's, that's part of the reason, right? But a part of that reducing costs is, and this is the topic that comes up anytime we talk about automation, is that you're reducing, you're replacing people with automation. And this is something that, I mean, you know this, uh, isn't always widely embraced. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. You're bringing, you're bringing, you're reducing the cost of manufacturing by increasing automation. So that's great. We can bring factories back to the U S but at the same time, we're reducing the cost because we're getting rid of the most expensive cost, which is people. <laughs> How are companies going to address this? Well, I think that in order to bring back uh, manufacturing at scale, or at least the most strategic parts of manufacturing, yes, you have to create more efficient processes. And, and parts of the, the, I would say, the process need to be automated in order to make them more efficient. So that, that's always going to be there. Um, however, um, the form that those will be brought back is not a completely automated lights out factory uh, like some people describe. Uh, what we actually need is for people on the ground uh, to participate in improving the system. So parts of the system or the process are going to be automated, but other parts are today unknown in terms of uh, you know, how you actually can approach improving those processes. Um, and that's why people are so important. Um, and what we need is, is essentially three things to not just automate the process, not just to bring manufacturing, but to make sure that people are part of that, uh, that structure in the process. Uh, the first thing that, that we need I believe is, is a data-driven culture, right? So as we bring back manufacturing or even improve manufacturing that exists today um, in, in the West, um, we don't really have access uh, to all the right data to make the right decisions. And uh, if we don't have access, we can't really make ongoing improvements and adjustments. And we're essentially working constantly on past assumptions. Um, and that's where IoT comes in or other technologies that enable us to, to extract that data uh, to be able to make those decisions. The second thing that needs to change um, is, is a really a fundamental change in culture 
um, around augmenting and digitizing knowledge. So I mentioned previously that uh, traditional automation, just manufacturing in general, uh, treats people as components in the system. And that's why we call, you know, it, even the language around it is workers, you know, those who do the work. Um, but what we really need is to turn workers on the production lines at all levels of the manufacturing uh, organization into thinkers. Um, and, and that is a process that requires a couple of different things. First, of course, we need to make sure that we educate and prepare the people that we have for that new wave of, of reshoring or, or innovation within manufacturing domestically. Uh, the second thing that we need is we need to have tools that help people make sense of that, you know, the vast amounts of data. And that's where AI comes in. Um, so to me, that culture change of augmenting, digitizing knowledge for people, turning workers into thinkers, AI and data are fundamental and kind of inextricable components of that because we have to elevate insights that puts people, you know, that put people into a position to be able to innovate and to actually change and alter the process. Um, and I think that the third part of it is that the process itself need, needs to change. So the way we think about traditional manufacturing uh, needs to change fundamentally in terms of the processes and tools that we implement. Um, and agile as a process or as a methodology comes to mind. Um, agile methodology is not new, it has roots in manufacturing, but um, you know, we can say that it kind of took a two decade detour coming from manufacturing into software development. And it has been uh, augmented by the data and the real time feedback loops that exist in software development. Um, and now we have the capability and the infrastructure to bring that back into the manufacturing processes. Um, and agile methodologies and the way you constantly adjust and experiment and innovate based on real time data uh, puts people in the very center uh, of that process. So we actually have an opportunity, you know, this is kind of a long uh, winded uh, description, but you know, in bringing back manufacturing uh, to the West or to the US, we actually have a tremendous opportunity by using the right methodologies and the right technologies to put people right in the center of the manufacturing process and arguably in a way that hasn't been done before. And this will require training I mean, this sounds to me like it's going to require training employees for new roles, new skills, um, uh, which opens up another can of worms. Who, who's responsible for that? Is, is it, is it the, the, the companies like Augury uh, or the manufacturers themselves who are going to have to be training up people? Is it going to be up to, uh, you know, junior colleges, colleges? Uh, how are we going to upskill this new batch of employees that are going to, to work in kind of this new, uh, th this new world of manufacturing that we're talking about. I think we can't really afford to be in a position where we can kind of gradually implement this, right? So we really need a concerted effort around this. You know, traditionally you would have the business side or kind of the need, uh, try to innovate and implement new processes. Right. And then at some point you'd have companies and vendors, um, kind of help with that and then eventually it will trickle down into the universities and then the government would step in and create the kind of regulations around it i think what we really need is a good rethink and to work you know to, to have these different entities working together and create uh you know really new playbooks and new, new, new ways uh to educate people um at scale uh because we are going to see tremendous issues in adoption right as we try to reshore or bring new technologies into manufacturing uh, without that, uh, that, that strong infrastructure for education. So I think it's, it's, it's the responsibility both of companies like Agria, absolutely, because you know, thinking about how that technology is implemented and serving as a vessel for, for its adoption as part of our role. It's also up to the companies to understand that their uh, workforce, right, or, or thinker force, I would say, right, is, 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 is really in, is really there and really invest in the people who are at the edges of this, um, who can adopt the technology and for the government to uh, you know, create a tremendous investment in, in that education to prepare the areas uh, where we are going to potentially reshore in the future um, in terms of skill sets and in terms of you know, digital savviness in general uh, to be able to, to, to adopt. Okay. 
Well, uh, Artem uh, Krupinev, Vice President of Strategy at Augury, uh, thanks for joining us. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to talk about, um, you know, uh, what's going to be happening, what we expect to be see happening in manufacturing, uh, hopefully in, in the not too distant future. Um, we, there is a link out to uh, the Augury website underneath the player page down there. You can actually go out there and check out what Augury is doing in this space. So uh, once again, Artem, thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. And that is it uh, for our show today. As usual, if there is someone uh, you would like to see on the show or some topic you would like to see us cover or some piece of equipment or software, let us know. Send your ideas to us at qdl at qualitydigest.com and uh, I will do my best to get those on the show. Uh, thanks for joining us today and we will see you on the next QDL. So long. <music>